Okay, now we can start. Four o'clock, a little bit after, we have about 75 participants so far. Thank you very much for joining uh, our second webinar from the Wireless Communication Alliance, Terra Head Technology, the new 6G. Me, Peter Walter, I'm the president of the Wireless Communications uh, Alliance. <clears throat> and uh, my email you see here, if you contact me, you get more information, peter.walter, wca.org. Or for more information, visit our website, uh, Wireless Communications Alliance. What are we doing? So we have founded in 1994. Uh, we are a non-profit uh, organization uh, leading um, the education and awareness and communication connections, community accesses and uh, approaches to the wireless industry. Our board, me, Peter Walter, the president, then we have Jeremy Toll as vice president. We have Tom Hunt as the treasurer. We have Tom Mitchell. We have a lot of Toms as the secretary. We have Brian Ogata as director. Our latest and youngest member of the gang is Jeff Yang as director. And then we have Tom Rowe from uh, CAG uh, as director. Uh, Amon Musavi is a young kid, 23 years old, so very great in marketing communication. And um, last but not least, Christine Cordieu is our admin. She's responsible for all these mailing lists, what you can see. And also when we have live events for the food, what we serve. Thank you to our sponsors. Without our sponsors, we could not make it. Uh, our missions are based on sponsorship donations. The biggest industrial uh, uh, sponsors are Aspil, CIG, and Google. CIG is our latest sponsors in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for sponsor our missions. CIG stands for Cambridge Industrial Group. Um, other smaller uh, sponsors are Energist, ETI, Mobile Expert, and Sensitel. Uh, we have partnered this event with IoT Nations. Um, they have we have twenty five thousand. They have twenty five thousand plus digital transformations information also uh, about events, contacts, and IoT, like the name says. Um, as a partner for WCA, if you go over there, you get a code promo code WCA200, which grants you a special fee and also a special drive test time. A little bit housekeeping before we really start off. Um, on the right side, you see the, the Zoom chat or comment section. Please use this for questions. We will uh, answer questions after each session and also at the end of the show. Um, the presentation and recordings will be available within 48 hours. You can find them on our website under archive. And last but not least, greetings to the world. We are not a local company anymore, organization anymore. We have uh, friends, participants from Europe, of course, from West Coast, East Coast, from Europe, from the Middle East, especially sharing things also to Japan. We have Singapore on the line, and of course, China also. Thank you very much for joining this show. And now let's start. Terra Health Technology, the new 6G. Our moderator is Ayan Tahiri. He is a student at UC Davis and also consultant uh, for Aspil's Terra Health Division. Uh, Ayan, the floor is yours. Uh, please hand over. Great, thank you so much, Peter, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Wireless Communication Alliance's Terahertz Technology Webinar. Today, we'll be together exploring the potential for Terahertz Technology in applications that Terahertz can fill the role of in 6G communication technology and beyond. So bridging the Terahertz gap, 6G technology. Next slide. Um, can I go next slide, Peter? Thank you. So before we discuss how terahertz can fill in the gap with various technologies, we need to discuss exactly what is terahertz technology. So when we discuss terahertz technology, we are talking about technology that manipulates electromagnetic radiation of frequencies generally between the range of 0.3 to 30 terahertz. 
and it is generally used for sensing and communications applications. However, it's not always limited to these applications. We see these in many different fields. However, three fields come to mind in particular when we talk about terahertz technology. Those three fields are below communications, biology, and when we refer to biology, we are talking about both biological sciences research as well as in a hospital setting and manufacturing. So it comes to the question of why terahertz technology in comparison, for example, infrared technology or maybe even microwave technology. Next slide. So the reason why terahertz technology um, can be a very useful tool for many different industries is four particular points. So number one, it is considered very human friendly radiation. And what we mean by that is that if you come into contact with terahertz radiation, you will not be harmed. It is very useful in biology and hospital applications for sensing of things within your body. And it is non-ionizing radiation, meaning it's completely safe for medical use. Another reason why terahertz is very useful is its high chemical sensitivity. Terahertz has been classically used to measure molecules millions of miles away in space, detecting chemicals beyond our atmosphere. And it can do that through a tool used very commonly by researchers called spectroscopy, meaning that com chemical compounds can absorb terahertz electromagnetic frequencies and based on the absorbance of those frequencies, we can determine a chemical identification. Another reason why terahertz is a very useful tool is because it has high quality imaging. So many of you, if not all of you, when you've been to the airport, have stepped through a security scanner. And those security scanners are very commonly associated with terahertz technology, as terahertz can essentially image particles or image objects that exist beneath your clothes and come up with clear detection of whether or not you have a threat on you or not. Another reason terahertz is a very useful tool is it's great bandwidth. It has higher transmission rates in comparison to other devices utilizing other frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these industry applications. Next slide. Thank you. So, Terahertz is actually very commonly used in tumor detection nowadays. So in our figure down there, we can see A, B, C, and D. D being the least presence of tumor and uh, kind of like the early stages and A being a very full-fledged tumor. And we can see that over time, terahertz actually, the imaging tool uses, um, when you use terahertz as an imaging tool, it produces great contrast between non-tumor tissue and tumor tissue based on the water differences between the two. And on the absolute right, you can see a classic MRI image of a brain tumor. And you can see that the terahertz produces very great contrast, which is very useful for doctors and researchers. Another very fascinating um, recent discovery of terahertz is nucleotide identification. These are the building blocks to our DNA sequence, our genome. And basically terahertz is able to identify the four different building blocks that build up our various DNAs and genomes. And this can be used in the future for, for example, figuring out whether or not there is a mutation within our genome causing a certain disease. Next slide. Now, moving on a little bit to what we said before is terahertz is very commonly used in imaging security, meaning that you can be shined uh, terahertz radiation and be without harm and it can be used to essentially determine whether or not there's a threat on your body and spectroscopy which is a very common tool historically used for terahertz uh, chemical identification using absorbances of terahertz electromagnetic radiation so it comes to the question terahertz is very useful very versatile but it is still not a ubiquitous technology. We don't see it in our everyday use as much as infrared or microwave technology. And commonly, this is referred to as a terahertz gap. Next slide. So the terahertz gap, when we're talking about this, we are talking about the lack of 
commercial availability of terahertz technology in comparison to other technologies, such as technology that uses infrared radiation and technology that uses microwave radiation. This can be due to many reasons. However, what comes to mind is the most common reason why terahertz has not entered the commercial market as successfully as infrared or microwave using technologies is the source of terahertz radiation is not really efficiently commercially available. However, this is changing. We see every year that more commercial terahertz technology is entering the market. And we ask ourselves, what is the impact and what are the possibilities when terahertz can now finally commercially enter the market? Next slide. So we look at the evolution of communications technology. We are currently in the 5G present. However, there is a lot of commotion and discussion about 6G technology. What is this necessarily? It, when you read about it, it may even seem like science fiction. However, when you consider the possibilities of terahertz technology and its direct involvement in 6G communications, we see that what is may appear as science fiction to the present day is becoming very much a possible reality in the future. A note is that 6G technology is not something we're going to see tomorrow or even a year from now. 6G technology is a reality of the future more like a decade away. Uh, next slide, please. So what is exactly 6G technology? 6G technology can be many different things. However, when we consider what we've discussed about terahertz technology and its association with 6G technology, some possibilities of 6G technology that are being discussed, for example, are high capacity communication and low latency. Another example is health monitoring. So the ability for our devices to be active monitors of our heartbeat, blood flow, blood composition, or even other hazardous chemicals that have entered our body. And on the topic of hazardous chemicals, the ability for terahertz technology to sense the air quality around us, or potentially the presence of gas toxicity, for example, like carbon monoxide that has maybe contaminated your room and is slowly building up. Our technology can essentially, using terahertz, sense these contaminants. Now, what is to me one of the most important aspects of the terahertz integration to 6G is universal device integration. The ability for one band of frequency, terahertz, to accomplish many versatile tasks that I'm very happy that our speakers today will be diving in very deep in today. So on that note, I would like to introduce our three speakers. So our first is Professor Robert Weichel, professor at University of Virginia, a co-founder and CTO of Dominion Microprobes, who will be providing an overview of terahertz technology and insight into his cutting edge research being done at UVA relating to terahertz. We then see Jeffrey Hessler, who is the CTO of Virginia Diodes and a visiting faculty at University of Virginia. For more than 25 years, he has worked to create new technologies that utilize terahertz frequency band for scientific defense and research applications. Next, we see Jeremy Toll, who is the director of Asbill North America R&D, the WCA vice president and board member and advisory board member of the Millimeter Wave Coalition. So on that note, I'll hand over the floor to Professor Robert Weichel. Okay, thank you, Arian. Um, let's see, Peter, can you get my slide deck up? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name's Bobby Weichel, I'm at UVA, and I'm, I'm going to kind of add on to what Arian talked about and give you kind of an overview of, of some of the technologies we use to access the terahertz spectrum and, and a bit of an overview of, of kind of what is the unique character of the terahertz region, why, why it's interesting. So um, next slide, please. Um, so this is kind of an overview of where we'll be going. So I'm going to make a few remarks about just uh, features of the terahertz spectrum, um, go through some of the scientific applications that really um, jump-started uh, the technology development in this region, and then some of the uh, important challenges and kind of directions we're going in terms of device and, and technologies to access it. Um, so next slide. Um, so the terahertz region, 
loosely refers to the, the frequency range between about 100 gigahertz and 10 terahertz. Um, this is also sometimes called the submillimeter range because the wavelengths of, of the electronic signals in this range um, are less than a millimeter, hundreds, hundreds of microns. Um, the plot on the left shows um, a plot of the absorption of the Earth's atmosphere as a function of frequency. So if you look in the bottom, kind of the left side of the chart, we're looking in the microwave and RF region, kind of where most wireless communications is done nowadays. Um, as you move to the right, you move into the terahertz region, and you notice that the absorption of the atmosphere gets quite severe as you go up in frequency. So this is one of the primary um, issues in, in fielding terahertz um, systems, is that you have to deal with the absorption in the atmosphere. And this is often considered a challenge um, but actually, if you look at it from a dif different perspective, if you're a scientist, it's actually an opportunity. Um, because clearly, these signals in this frequency range interact strongly with, with uh, molecules. The, the absorption is really due to absorption of water vapor and oxygen in the Earth, on the Earth's atmosphere. And so um, spectros spectroscopists can use this to actually identify and study molecules. And that's one of the primary applications as driv that in the early days drove terahertz technology and is, is still a, a major um, reason that people um, use this part of the spectrum. Um, <clears throat> the terahertz spe region is also often called a terahertz gap. Um, Arian referred to that. Um, I often think of it as a bridge though. Um, if, if you look at kind of the lower end of the spectrum, we're really in the regime where electronics dominates, where you've got circuits, electronic devices, and that's how you implement your systems your, that, that access this part of the spectrum. If we look beyond the terahertz range, you're kind of moving into the infrared optics range. And so the terahertz is, really is the area that bridges the electronics and photonics world. And as a result, a lot of the systems kind of borrow from both of those different domains. Um, one of the persistent challenges is what technology to use to implement systems in this range. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just sort of overviewing kind of the, why it's attractive and what it's challenging. So in a nutshell, um, it's attractive for a couple of reasons. One, um, spectroscopy allows you to do a lot of interesting things, um, study molecules, study biological samples, um, do radio astronomy. Um, it's a relatively quiet part of the spectrum, not very used in terms of applications. Um, the wavelengths are short enough that you can get high resolution imaging, uh, fair penetration of materials, and large bandwidth, which is one of the attractions of why people want to look at it as a, as a potential area to do wireless communications. The challenges of it, though, are pretty significant. Um, one is that there's a scarcity of device technologies for accessing that part of the spectrum compared to the lower frequencies. So, for instance, transistors are ubiquitous um, in RF and in microwave. Um, the first terahertz transistor wasn't invented until about five years ago, where, you, where we actually had gain at a terahertz. And, and CMOS devices are actually useful up to a few hundred gigahertz. But really, this is a range where kind of the electronics technologies we're used to are not really available. And that has really impacted how we implement systems. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the applications that have really driven the initial development of, of terahertz technology. Um, the main driver early on was radio astronomy and that's still one of the major um, uh, applications that, that, lead, that has really spurred technology development. Um, the, the image shows a picture of radio telescopes at the Atacama Millimeter Array, which is a, a large millimeter telescope array in Chile, um, located at 5,000 meters above sea level. These are 12 meter dishes, and um, people are familiar sort of with this picture, but if you look to the right of it, uh, maybe a more unfamiliar picture is kind of the cylindrical object you see kind of to the right. That's a receiver cartridge that's in each of these telescopes. And at the feed of each of these is a small antenna that couples all the energy gathered by the dish onto a small superconducting detector that is held near four degrees Kelvin, which is what's required to get near quantum limited sensitivity to actually do the measurements. And that, that type of technology is what allowed us to take pictures of the black hole, which is down below, and other um, uh, celestial objects. 
Um, the technologies used for these telescopes, large, a lot of it was developed at UVA, largely because the National, Astronom National Radio Astronomy Observatory is located in, in Charlottesville. Um, so detectors and also um, to the kind of underneath, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a copper block you see. Inside of that is a diode. And those are used to essentially upconvert signals to drive this receiver. Um, those, that, that actual, that tripler is what it's called, was developed by Jeffrey Hustler, our other speaker at VDI. And these are the technologies that really were developed to allow you to do state-of-the-art measurements at, um, for radio astronomy. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, other applications that use this technology include atmospheric remote sensing. So um, satellites that have some of these receivers in them look down and they look at the, uh, the emissions of molecules that make up the Earth's upper atmosphere, as well as uh, man-made emissions um, that are contributing to global warming and, and um, ozone depletion. And you can map out the concentration of these molecules in the atmosphere and sort of study what's going on. And, and that's one of the um, early uses of terahertz technology was to, to deploy them in satellites like this to do those types of measurements. Okay, next slide. A another application that's driven it has been um, defense, Dep Department of Defense applications. So what you're seeing in the upper image here is a scale model of a tank that's on the upper left. This is a very detailed model that's built by the Army. And what that allows them to do is that they can then basically do radar signature measurements on these models if they scale the wavelength of the radar in, in proportion to the size of the model. And when they do that, the radars actually operate in the terahertz range. So they can use this in a controlled environment to collect data on different um, interesting objects that they would like to have data on for their real radars. Um, to the right is a radar image of the tank and that image though is taken at 1.6 terahertz using diode technologies that were developed at UVA. Um, you can also do imaging through thin clothes and, and uh, uh, various objects like paper. Those are shown at the bottom. And so there's really, these have kind of been the driving um, applications that have really driven people to, to work on technologies to access terahertz spectrum. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, an emerging application is 6G wireless applications. So um, there's obvious reasons for that. There's the, the spectrum in the RF range is getting increasingly congested. There's enormous bandwidth available at terahertz spectrum. There are windows in the atmosphere, if you look at the plot, where the attenuation is reasonably low that you can actually transmit a signal through, around 94 gigahertz, 140 and 220. Um, and also your antenna rays and all of this scaled down with wavelength. And so you get much more compact circuit architectures. So there's some really um, important things driving people to work at terahertz frequencies for other applications other than scientific applications, such as wireless tra data transmission. Um, the challenges remain though. The, the device and electronics technologies for accessing this part of the spectrum are still expensive. They've come a long ways over the last decade. Um, but they do cost a lot, and um, a lot of the usual techniques we use to implement systems at lower frequencies just don't work. Interfacing and packaging are major issues to optimize these devices. Um, the test and measurement infrastructure for characterizing what you build, it's still somewhat limited. It, it's, uh, Jeffrey will talk about all the great advances that have been made, but it's still, you're not going to have access to the same types of technologies you have at lower frequencies. And one of the main challenges is that we have legacy scientific users like radio astronomers operating at these higher frequencies. And if people are going to start using it for wireless applications, we need to start understanding ways to do spectrum sharing to accommodate the legacy scientific users who really can't change their frequencies. So um, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the technologies we use. So the, the workhorse technology has been for about 50 years, the Schottky diode. Um, on the left, I have various um, plots that sort of show the sensitivity of the diode compared to, uh, compared to other technologies. If you look at the lower sort of table, um, I'm listing detector sensitivities. This is basically, in a nutshell, the minimum power you can detect with a particular technology. On the Schottky diode, you can uh, detect about a picowatt, and it's about as good or about, much better than about an order of magnitude or so than most other room temperature detector technologies. To get better than that, you generally have to cool things down to make a superconducting device, and that's what the SIS detector and the kit are. The images on the right 
show the evolution of the diode over time. The diode has kind of evolved from kind of a whisker contacted device, which is shown in the upper right, to more of a planar integrated device. And, and that was done for a number of reasons, largely led by Tom Crow when he was at UVA. That was to kind of control the geometry of the device to have more control over the parasitics, which really control electrically what the device does at high frequencies, and allow you to do more sophisticated technologies, okay? Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, this is continued, I'm gonna skip this one. You can use diodes to, as varactors, and Jeffrey will talk about that. Um, you can also transfer the diodes to other uh, substrates, which allow you to make highly integrated circuits with interconnects. And that's kind of the direction we're going at UVA. What you're seeing at the bottom image is a integrated multiplier circuit that's on silicon, but the devices, the diodes are made of gallium arsenide. So we've actually transferred material to the silicon to be able to micromachine the silicon to make the carrier package. Um, let's go to the next slide. We also use micromachining technology to make probes, to actually measure devices, so measurement technology. These show images of a, of a micromachined probe. On the right is the housing connected to one of VDI's modules. Inside of that housing is a micromachined chip, which you can see in the upper left, that actually touches the device you're testing and allows it to interface to back-end in measurement instruments. And we like silicon because it's very robust mechanically as a substrate. And let's go to the next slide. And th these are just images of the chips that we make that go into the probes. And actually the next slide shows a movie, which let's go to that so we can see it before I run out of time. Um, what you're gonna see in this image is, uh, let's not play it yet. Uh, let me just say something about it first. What you're seeing is a, uh, an image on a uh, monitor of the silicon micromachine chip. And the image was, this movie was taken with an iPhone. So it's gonna switch between this image and the probe on a probe station. And you're gonna see, this probably illustrates as well as anything how robust these probes are. Um, the student who's working on this is gonna bang on it. And you can see that the probe actually survives quite well. So let's show the movie. And I'll narrate. Um, so you're, yeah, so this is the probe housing and there's a probe chip at the very tip that you can't see because it's way too small. You can see the microscope objective above. And now you're gonna watch the image of, that's the chip, the black, um, and he's gonna bang on it and knock it into the substrate. So if you normally did that with a wafer probe, you would break the probe and have to spend a thousand dollars to buy a new one. But the silicon is so strong, and this is what we use to do our integration, that it simply is resilient and it makes contact marks, which you can see on the pad, but it doesn't break. And as he bangs onto it, he's gonna move it around and bang it some more. Um, the chip is very strong. So it's mechanically a very nice substrate to do integration. And a lot of the instruments that we're working on now really are using silicon as a, as a carrier substrate to do the integration and micromachining. And let's go to the last slide. All of this is sort of coming together, um, yeah, one, yeah, to actually allow us to develop new technologies. So even though diode technologies and micromachine are kind of older technologies, um, we're actually using those to characterize and enable other people to build new technologies. So the probe you just saw was actually developed to, to help DARPA and Northrop Grumman develop the world's first terahertz amplifier. That's shown on the left, and that was measured with a probe you just saw. And on the right, um, the team that developed that's receiving the Guinness Book of World Records Award for the highest frequency amplifier. So that sort of shows you how the technology has grown and kind of what's available to access this part of the spectrum. So with that, I think I maybe have a minute. Um, I'll stop, and if there's anyone has a question or so, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Yeah, so actually, um, we have one question from Jeff. He's mm -hmm. asking, um, how does ground-based radio telescope, how can it be influenced by the massive deployment of terahertz communication technology in the future? So this is a major concern. Um, and there's actually a lot of people looking at, how do you, how do you allow them to share the spectrum? So in the radio astronomy, they, they do have one benefit is that most radio telescopes are located on the tops of high mountains in very remote places. So that, that is one um, way that they will deal with it. But the other is gonna require probably in the future the development of spectrum sensing equipment to kind of see what's happening in the spectrum to allow the astronomers to know um, if they're gonna be able to observe or not. And also there's gonna to have to be coordination between people wanting to use certain wireless bands um, at these high frequencies um, with the astronomers who really 
don't have the option of moving to different frequencies since they have to go where the science is telling them. So um, it is an emerging issue. Um, and there's a lot of people looking at different ways to allow them to share spectrum. And, um, and in short, that's, that's kind of how, what they're going to have to do. There's no solutions to it yet. Yep. Okay. Um, another question actually that I have for you is, um, why has the Shockey diode remained the most widely used technology for terahertz instruments? Um, does it have any limitations? Um, it does. It, it's, it's interesting. It, it's, it's been around for since the early 20th century. Um, and it's never completely been replaced at these frequencies. And, and I think a couple of the reasons, one, it, it's very well understood. We've been able to engineer kind of the device so that you can do a better job designing with it. And it's also surprisingly flexible. Um, often students think of diodes as just switches, but actually um, Shockey diodes can be used as detectors, um, very good detectors. And they can also you be used as a variable reactor, which is how we use them to generate signals. And, um, and so I think that the, the technology is, you know, if those who are not aware of it, is surprisingly flexible and uh, you can actually do a fair amount with it. So obviously where possible, it's often been replaced by transistors, but I think the expense currently of the current transistor technology is still shot keys give, are a good option and are, and are still a basis of most of the commercial instruments um, that you can buy now. And I think that's a nice little plug for Jeffrey. Um, any other questions? Um, actually, um, we're going to move on to okay. um, Jeffrey, but we will have a final Q&A session at the end of the last uh, talk. So if anyone has any questions, um, we have a few in the chat already. We can address those at the end. Thanks yeah. again, Bobby, for that very fascinating discussion. That was great. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker again, Jeffrey Hessler, who is the CTO of Virginia Diodes and a visiting faculty at the University of Virginia. Um, Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Um, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariane. Um, and uh, thanks for the great intro there, Bobby. Um, so I'm going to kind of move on from uh, the, kind of the, the kind of basic research to kind of describe some of the uh, work done at our company, Virginia Diodes, on test and measurement um, throughout the millimeter wave up into the terahertz range. So next slide, please. Um, the uh, so um, to, to start the, uh, our, the, the basic uh, starting point of our company was basic science over, over many years, starting at the university, which we came from, uh, things like uh, Bobby described radio astronomy, also fusion plasmas, molecular spectroscopy. There's a wide range of basic scientific applications uh, that have driven Terrence technology for, for many, many years, decades. Um, next slide, please. Um, but commercial applications are something we've, um, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, something, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, or something that has really uh, been uh, uh, coming along over the last five, 10 years, things like we've seen. This is actually a, a video in the London subway of the, the, this is actually from the, uh, the government, uh, the, the, the City of London website, looking at using terahertz to image knives underneath clothing um, to, to help in increase security and safety in the subway systems. And this is something ac actively being used today. Um, and, and that's something that, that's a very growing application for terahertz. Um, and then um, things from weather forecasting, um, we talked about chemical and biological detection, and then the, the focus of today's talk, wideband and secure communications. So next slide, please. Um, so we've uh, communications above 100 gigahertz. It's uh, right now, most communications uh, kind of uh, are down at uh, gigahertz to maybe tens of gigahertz for cell towers and things. Um, but uh, there's a lot of work now um, at uh, a lot of people talking about uh, communications above 100 gigahertz. Uh, Ericsson is one company that's um, been uh, 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 talking about this. This was a, a technology review from 2017 done by Ericsson. Um, and, but there's uh, 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 many other companies, Intel, Nokia, 
um, Samsung, uh, Intel, uh, and then countries from US, China, South Korea, EU, all interested in 6G and talking about it. Um, applicate, the type of applications they're looking at doing are uh, micro and macro cell backhaul, um, events from sporting events to concerts, uh, ports, uh, uh, airports, and, and uh, me medical uh, for use of, during surgeries. And in the left, I've shown a 100 gigabit uh, per second link demo done uh, by Ericsson and Deutsche Telekom just at the end of last year, um, demonstrating uh, the, the, some of the kind of power of these to do this kind of uh, last mile uh, fiber communication. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, uh, so um, uh, the, uh, another kind of evidence of what's happening above 100 gigahertz, the World Radio Communication Conference in 2019 um, was held at the end of last year. Before that, there were no allocations above 275 gigahertz, but they've now pushed that up to 450 gigahertz. Um, and uh, looking at increasing usage of, of those bands from 100 gigahertz up to 240 gigahertz. And so there's been a steady growth in interest in this 100 plus gigahertz communications, but this is in the very early stages with products uh, not estimated to appear for at least say 10 years from now. So, so this is kind of very preliminary research, um, but, but lots of interest in this and, and growing steadily. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, in order to develop this technology, um, the, uh, you need to be able to, uh, to measure this. That was something Bobby hinted at. And that, tech, that equipment needs to be better than the devices that are, that are being, um, uh, uh, th than their testing in terms of bandwidth, distortion, power. And so how do you uh, uh, test this in this new region, this, this kind of uh, terahertz gap? And that's something that we've been focusing on as a company. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, for test and measurement of 100 gigahertz, there's a lot of requirements, very complex requirements from different devices under test, from package devices to uh, measuring on wafer, as we saw in Bobby's talk, um, differential over the air testing. Um, you need to test lots of different aspects of devices from S parameters to distortion, uh, system level performance, like air, air, uh, uh, air versus magnitude, EVM, ACPR. Um, so how do we, um, how do you uh, take a lot of this test equipment that's available at microwaves up to say 40 gigahertz or even 100 gigahertz and extend that beyond 100 gigahertz? Things like signal generators, oscilloscopes, spectrum network analyzers. Next slide, please. Um, and so our company, Virginia Diodes, that's our focus really is terahertz technology. We do uh, work down to 50 gigahertz or even a bit below, but we're, our main prime focus as a company is between 100 gigahertz up into several terahertz. Next slide, please. In here. There. Um, so again, we've heard a uh, long, um, uh, amount of uh, technology that's um, the, uh, at uh, microwaves up to 40 gigahertz. There's all this uh, test and measurement equipment uh, available. And what we want to do is take that and extend that up into the terahertz range as efficiently as possible and to get the highest sensitivity as possible. We do, do that using these Shakti diodes that we heard about. If you can look at the next slide. There we go. Um, this is the same basic technology. Um, this was developed originally at the University of Virginia. Uh, now we're using this at, at the co company BDI. We do have our own small captive clean room. Uh, we make these diodes, uh, flip chip diodes for kind of mounting uh, lower frequencies up to integrated diodes shown at the bottom for operations up to three terahertz and even five terahertz. Next slide, please. Um, for signal generation, um, it's we use the nonlinearity of the Shockey diode, either the, the current voltage or uh, capacitance voltage curve to generate harmonics of a lower frequency signal. Um, we want to do that as efficiently as possible. And uh, so it's really you send an input frequency and you get harmonics out. It's as simple as that. Next slide, please. 
Um, we take these uh, nonlinear Shaki diodes, we mount them in waveguide based components in a split block design. We use waveguide because it's, it's a very low loss medium. Microstrip might be a DD per millimeter at 600 gigahertz, where waveguide is about a tenth of that in, in DD per millimeter. Um, and we have multipliers like this going up to three terahertz. Next slide, please. So taking these uh, devices, we take microwave components like synthesizers and amplifiers. We combine those with the Shaki diode multipliers and we can generate sources as, as shown here. Um, we design these multipliers so that the majority of the power is in a single tone. So we get very high spectral purity and very good phase noise. And, and we'll see an evident uh, a measurement of that later. Next slide, please. Um, and so we can take a signal generator like that shown in the upper left and extend this uh, just a turnkey source tunerless instantaneous sweeping you can do rapid sweeping chirping and uh, and so this is an example at, at the band from 220 to 330 gigahertz and getting uh, quite high power over this band next slide please um, the uh, signal detection is using the same uh, shocky diodes um, except in this case, we're using them to down convert, to do basically heterodyne down conversion, just like uh, just a simple radio, classic heterodyne approach. And then, to, but we want to do that with very uh, good efficiency and low, low noise and high sensitivity. Next slide, please. And so these same Shockey mixers allow us to extend the spec uh, instrument like spec spectrum analyzers into the terahertz as well, allow you to measure signal spectral purity, things like phase noise and, and to look at wideband uh, communication signals, which is what we'll be looking at, uh, I'll be look, focusing on a little bit later. Next slide, please. Um, so this is actually a measurement at 625 gigahertz of a, um, a spectrum. So that, that central peak is actually at 625 gigahertz. These are 10 dB per division. So showing very good spectral purity. And, a, and so this is a terahertz spectral measurement using but using a microwave device extended by the Shaki diodes. Next slide, please. Um, and for um, wideband uh, signal generation and detection, um, oops, sorry. Um, the, uh, 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 so for these uh, communication systems, uh, the, the big interest is in wide channel bandwidths, uh, up to say 10 gigabits per second, very complex modulation schemes, uh, so up in the upper right, a 16 palm signal or um, OFDM type signals. And we've developed um, a, uh, a, uh, a series of compact up and down converters to, uh, to uh, be able to generate and, and detect these signals um, uh, with very low distortion and uh, very, uh, very high power and signal to noise. Next slide, please. Um, so the, um, for this wideband signal generation detection, this is a, a schematic of what we, uh, uh, of the basic structure. We take uh, one of these uh, Shockey mixers, we actually feed this uh, complex modulated signal at the microwave frequencies into the mixer. In, into actually the intermediate frequency uh, path of the mixer. Um, we then upconvert that into the millimeter waves. And um, in order to clean up the signal, we, will, we can use a bandpass filter or an amplifier in order to boost the, the power level. So next slide, please. Um, the bandpass filters, these are some examples. These are classic waveguide bandpass filters, extremely high rejection, 100 dB out of band rejection very low in-band insertion loss. We have these throughout the uh, millimeter wave range, even up into uh, uh, 500, 600 gigahertz, we have, we've done these type of filters. And so these can be used to clean up these signals and, uh, and, uh, and do that. So next slide, please. Um, and then we can do ampl amplifiers to amplify these signals. Um, we have amplifiers from uh, 50 gigahertz all the way up to 250 gigahertz. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And so this is kind of an example of one of these systems in use. Um, this is actually a 140 gigahertz communication link demo. Um, this was dem demonstrated last year at the Brooklyn uh, 5G Summit um, and is also being used for experiments by the group at NYU led by Ted Rappaport for doing channel sounding experiments. And so in this case, you take a, a four to eight gigahertz signal, convert that to, to D band or 140 to 144 gigahertz and then down convert and you can do things like channel sounding and, and uh, uh, to, uh, to, to down convert that signal. Um, and, so the, the, uh, and so you can kind of see the system there on a tripod uh, broadcasting across the, 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 the floor of the show. Next slide, please. And then this is kind of one last example uh, before I conclude. This is um, a sub terahertz. It's a test bed for 6G. This was some work done uh, by Keysight, and there's a white paper with the link shown below. Um, this is uh, for doing 6G uh, research. Uh, so you, you're taking these microwave instruments, and we're, we're going up into the, uh, in this case, it'll be around 140 gigahertz, and doing uh, basically signal generation and then detection. And this is how you would then go ahead and test devices being used for 6G research. So next slide, please. And so this is, a, a, I mentioned a 16 QAM before. This is actually a 16 QAM signal, used at, but at 144 gigahertz. Um, we've been able to generate the signal with very low distortion, 2% EDM. And uh, they had similar uh, measurement quality all the way up to 64 QAM. So next slide. And again, this is actually an example where we're doing actually 10 gigahertz of occupied bandwidth with 16 QAM and still sub 5% EVM. So, so uh, quite, uh, uh, we're quite happy with these results. So next slide, please. Oh, uh, sorry, next slide. Uh, sorry. This should be the conclusion. There we go. And so I'll go ahead and uh, end here. Um, so Terrace technology, it's an emerging field, um, uh, but, but now rapidly moving into applications, things like uh, communications, the development of these terahertz transistors, uh, extending silicon up into many hundreds of gigahertz. There's been some exciting work on that, um, but also a lot of three fives now with transistors operating up even to a terahertz. That's really opening up the possibilities and what we have worked on is being able to generate signals for doing uh, measurements throughout this, uh, this range uh, so that you can kind of make better instruments. So we'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that conversation and talk. Um, so I would just like to open the floor to some questions. Um, we have one from Fred. So he says that a primary issue with terahertz has been the limits on transmit power. Um, that can be produced by current devices. What is the state of the art in this area? Sure, that's a good question. So I'll, I'll focus on uh, solid state devices. There's, there are uh, various vacuum devices which can generate kilowatts of power throughout the terrace, but those kind of fill a room and require liquid cryogens. But for solid state devices, um, let's, let's say if we take the range of 200 to 300 gigahertz, um, the uh, 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 over that range right now, we can generate a uh, power level up to kind of hundreds of milliwatts using these solid state devices. Um, we use this for some scientific test applications. And um, for broadband sources, we can get say five milliwatts. Um, transistors are, are uh, up at this 200 to 300 gigahertz range are still kind of uh, being developed. We're, they're, they're getting power of order milliwatts. Um, but that's kind of like, like say at that 200 to 300 gigahertz range, that, that's kind of uh, one of the challenges. But there's a lot of exciting work on new 3.5s by nitride, a lot of different things, which I think will be increasing that power. It's been steadily increasing over the last five or 10 years, just more and more power available with wider bandwidth. So I think it's very exciting for the future. All right, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for that conversation on commercial usage of terahertz technology. So 
On that note, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Jeremy Toll, who is the director of Asheville North America Research and Development Team, uh, the WCA vice president and board member, and also an advisory board member for the Millimeter Wave Coalition. We'll be discussing uh, consumers' perspective on applications of terahertz and government regulations on commercial technology. Go ahead, Jeremy. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Peter, can you bring up our slide deck? So some of this material I have, I think um, Bobby and Peter, uh, Bobby and uh, Jeffrey have covered. Um, so I'm gonna go through a little bit quick in the interest of time and we can get some, uh, some good questions at the end. So Peter, can you go to the next slide? So this is just a high level graphic of where the terahertz range is in the spectrum. Um, basically it's bridging the gap between electrical and optical. Next, next slide. So you've seen this black hole slide before. Um, basically, there's been a lot of research in, a, in radio astronomy using terahertz. And we're an industrial company at Asheville, industrial control and building automation. So we thought if we can detect gases in faraway galaxies, then we can also use that same technology to find and analyze gases at smaller distances in our industrial applications. Next slide. So for non-invasive sensing, the techniques have different advantages. Um, we believe terahertz technology is showing great potential for multivariable non-invasive sensing. Um, currently there's things like optical sensing and in infrared and acoustic and ultrasonic, and they all have a variety of different interesting applications for non-invasive sensing, but we've decided to look a little further into terahertz sensing to, to see um, what the advantages could be in our research. Next slide. So terahertz has a long history. Um, in Initially, it's been more for scientific applications, um, radio astronomy, non-destructive testing, um, eventually, it's gotten into industrial markets, and up until now in 2020, um, it's heading towards telecoms, which is why we we're discussing the evolution from 5G to what's being now coined as 6G. Next slide. So Asbel, my company, is, a, is an industrial IoT sensor company. We, we do many things from um, industrial factories, building automation, oil and gas. Um, variety of other things for process equipment, things like that. So we actually have a lot of senses at edge nodes that we'd like to detect things in different ways. And currently a lot of the sensors are in, in line. In, it could get fouled up by some kind of um, chemical or heat, and it's very difficult to measure things directly without extrapolating. So we're very interested in non-invasive sensing for doing things to, uh, to help in harsh environments. And, and other areas where it may be more difficult to, to achieve that, uh, that measurement. Next slide. So like I mentioned before, we're, we're looking at measuring in harsh environments, um, de detecting imperfections on surfaces of objects. Um, we don't wanna cut pipes or maintain a transmission line to cool down a substance prior to measurement. Um, we'd like to do things in real time, non-contact, non-destructive testing. And there's definitely applications in semiconductor processing, Q quality assurance for pharmaceuticals, um, different industrial measurement and sensing applications, and certainly communications. Next slide. So our favorite hobby actually is sensing uh, hostile environments. And most of us, uh, at least on our team, like to grill. So. Um, that's that's the real motivation for our for our terahertz sensing. Next slide. But seriously, um, some of the things that we need need to do to actually pay our pay our mortgage um, is looking into industrial applications such as sensing gas parameters, level sensing, composition scent detection, um, temperature le leak and crack detection. And if you notice here on the left and right, there's actually VDI extender boxes to measure, um, to transmit and to measure the signal in, in a system like this. And uh, 
there's like a waveguide measurement from a company called OML that, that put this together um, to show the different um, horns that need to be used for these electro-optical electro terahertz measurement. Next slide. So spectroscopy is the is the area that we've been looking into. Um, there's different well-known uh, mediums for doing that: infrared, ultraviolet, nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR. And we're actually focusing on terahertz spectroscopy, which you're taking a beam source with its radiation, shining it into a sample, and then analyzing what what happens um, after that. So on the right-hand side, you see the spectrum of the sample, and it's got some uh, transmission percentage and the wavelength. If you go to the next slide, there's a little more detail on, on a molecule. Um, so the data inside in spectroscopy would reveal things like the chemical compositions of solids, liquids, or gases. This happens to be a, a vanillin, and there's some different bonds, and there's peaks at different frequencies, and that's how you, you detect the signature for, um, for that substance. Next slide. So for factory monitoring um, in our applications, with the terahertz sensing, we're looking at things like tomography and wave radar, um, looking at crack, crack detection and gas leaks, and then security monitoring um, and 3D and environmental and equipment scanning. Next slide. So the terahertz wave radar, um, you can do things like sensing gas leaks and the presence of chemicals in, in a large environment, um, different things like crack detection in the factory, uh, radioactive plumes and nuclear plants. So those are pretty key safety, um, safety applications. Uh, of course, on the right-hand side, you see the millimeter wave scanner. That's more for security monitoring than discussing below. And there's other things like tomography technology where you can scan the, um, the environment of a 3D object. Um, and that's not limited to the high temperatures that infrared technology could be affected by. Um, so you can, you can actually do pretty accurate um, slices of 3D images on using that kind of thing. Next slide. So finally, um, after, a quick uh, introduction, we actually have um, on the left side, the ultimate sensor and actuator solution, which is um, kind of the Swiss army knife with probably um, 200 blades on it. And that actually could be bought on Amazon for $10,000. Um, but what, we're, what we have been using is that analogy of a Swiss army knife that we'd like to do a universal monitoring system or look into things which could detect um, a variety of things from equipment mount function and identification for structural and crack monitoring, um, 3D renditions to analyze factory and employee security, gas chemical leak detection and biocontamination detection, and then uh, closed circuit. So anyway, um, the idea is to take all of these different parameters and make it into something that can monitor a bunch of different things um, because terahertz technology has been pretty expensive in the past. And we'd like to look at um, using that for, for a lot of different industrial monitoring applications. So with that, um, does anyone have any questions? Great. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy, for that conversation on the consumer perspective of terahertz technology. Um, just to get the ball rolling, I have a couple questions actually. So. Um, first question is, what is the advantage of non-invasive sensing opposed to other types of sensing in your perspective? Well, I think basically the, the main thing is that we're able to measure in, um, in environments that are harsh. Um, a lot of things are high temperature or um, they may be previously need to go into some kind of oil or some kind of liquid that could be corrosive to that sensor. So you could damage that, that sensor element. Um, or you have to cut a pipe or you have to cut cut into a certain area and it makes installation very difficult. So we're thinking that things like the tricorder from Star Trek would be very interesting for, um, for different applications. We know that you can't solve everything this way, but the goal is to try to, to look into things where you don't actually have to cut into something or, or uh, be in a, a hostile environment. 
that um, um, that we're already using now. So I think this will add a lot of value to different industrial applications. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, actually, we have another question from Jeff. Does Asbel have terahertz type sensors deployed today? Um, no, not at the moment. It's in a, it's more in a research and development phase. Great. But we are definitely looking into it. Great. So thank you, everyone, so much, both the audience for your great participation. Ariane, Ar Ar we, we still have one more thing, the millimeter oh. wave. Right. My apologies. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Peter, next slide. Okay. So today I'm doing double duty, um, second organization that ASBIL is actually a part of called the Millimeter Wave Coalition. And this is a group, an industry group that's been brought together to uh, promote advocacy for enabling access to spectrum above 95 gigahertz. So basically the problem right now um, fundamentally is there's no rules about frequencies above 95 gigahertz um, there, or very limited rules. So there's been an issue because uh, I think somebody mentioned was asking a question about radio astronomy and um, they, they had the run of that frequency for a long time and now people are interested in doing communications and industrial applications in these higher frequencies. But the FCC hasn't put together any specific rules about that um, that for the spectrum that we're really looking at using for a variety of reasons. So the coalition has been put together to try to help guide, guide the uh, FCC and NTIA on, on uh, these kind of rules. So next slide. Um, so like I mentioned, it's, it's a group, this is a group of innovative companies where we're looking to basically remove re regulatory barriers and help to provide guidance for things 95 gigahertz to 450 gigahertz and above. Um, there's talk now more about terahertz spectroscopy. Um, so it's not limited by any particular use or technology. And you can see in a couple of slides that um, the group of companies is quite, quite diverse. Um, Vir Virginia Diodes is one of the companies as well. Um, next slide. So we put some press releases out through the years. This is one sampling about a year, a um, little over a year ago. Basically, we're um, focusing on the wireless industry is really focused on 5G. That's the hot thing now. Um, getting more mid-band spectrum, but actually there's room in the higher bands um, that the millimeter wave coalition is urging the NTIA to, to try to facilitate more access to that spectrum for non-federal use. Right now it's being used for radio astronomy, probably NASA uses and satellites and perhaps some other things. Um, so the, the use of that technology faces some delays um, before we can actually use it for the market. So um, there's safety limit concerns. There's no provisions for terahertz spectroscopy, for example. There are products on the market that are using these, but the problem is if you have a, a product using that and then the, um, the government decides to shut down that band and says it's basically illegal to use it, then all of your investment that you're using to develop those products is basically jeopardized and you know, you're, you have a product that's not, not legal, not legally able to be sold. So that's a problem. So uh, a lot of the companies are concerned about this. Next, next slide. Um, so we have really good companies on um, Nokia, Keysight, NYU Wireless is a, is a, and Northeastern are two university members and VDI, Samsung, Global Foundries and others. Um, Everyone has kind of a different interest. A lot of it is communications based, but um, there are others that are looking at spectroscopy and industrial applications. So if anybody's interested in joining that organization to help with setting some rule standards, um, please contact millimeterwavecoalition.org or contact me and I can, I can get you connected with the organization. So that's all I have about that. If there's anybody has questions about that or we can move on to the overall panel in the interest of time. All right, 
Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that conversation on government regulations. Um, we do have some specific questions for you, but um, as you're saying and suggested, we will move to the overall panel and then answer those questions in the overall panel as well. Okay. So let's go ahead and go back a little bit to Abdul, who asked a question to Bobby. So Bobby, um, Abdul is asking, will, include, will exclusion zones that is region of electromagnetic radiation? Um, are you, is he referring to, I assume, the exclusion zone, radio exclusion zones around radio telescopes? Um, so, um, um, I mean, um, in a sense, they, 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 there will be um, around remote telescopes, but of course, if, if people start utilizing the, uh, the, the um, spectrum in the range where they want to do uh, of observations, there's going to be conflicts that have to be resolved. So um, I, that hasn't, as to my knowledge, been resolved. It's actually something being worked on as to whether um, you're going to exclude people from actually using spectrum around these facilities, or is there going to be some sort of technique, technique or approach to allow them to share the spectrum? Um, generally, they're not observing all the time, and so there could be um, um, ways of, of doing um, scheduling of when people can use spectrum and not, or sp spectrum sensing, which would allow people to know, okay, someone's using spectrum here, so we need to move to some other part of the spectrum for some application. Um, so does, does that answer kind of uh, what what he was looking uh, asking Fortunately, about? Fortunately, he's left the lobby, so oh, we, will, okay. we, will, we will assume that that was the <laughs> best possible answer. But thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. So Jeffrey, um, next question is for you. Um, okay. This, oh, actually, I, I missed one. Sorry, Bobby. This one, this one is for you. So Mitchell is asking, with all of the absorption in the terahertz range, what specific frequency ranges are considered best for communications? Um, well, at the lower bands, the, there are certainly um, windows where the absorption is a bit lower, around um, 140, 220, and there's a few bands as you go up above that, um, that the, absor the, the sort of the, the um, absorption level gets worse progressively as you go higher. But certainly, I think in the kind of the near future, people are looking at the 140 and 220 bands as ones for potential um, use. Great. Yeah. And one final question for you, Bobby. Um, this is from Mike. Um, he's asking, aren't radio telescopes above 100 gigahertz very rare in Eastern um, US? Um, I think passive satellites are a difficult issue, uh, but solvable issue. Yes, uh, satellites are probably more of a, a, a problem for sort of emerging applications because they're actually looking down on the earth, whereas telescopes are looking into a quiet sky. Um, yes, most of the telescopes are actually located remotely, uh, far from high density populations. Um, there are some in populated areas in Europe. Um, and um, certainly I mentioned the Green Bank Telescope, which is located in the Eastern US as well. Um, there's some up in Massachusetts. Um, so, so there are telescopes actually near population centers. Um, to get to the really high frequencies though, they typically have to be located above most of the atmosphere so that you don't get the absorption. Um, satellites are maybe a more significant issue just because they're looking down and they're not in one particular place, they're orbiting the Earth. And so, um, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank yep. you so much. So, Jeffrey, the next question is for you. So, Rosita is asking, what are the challenges in substrate in 6G research? What is the status of that research? So, as far as the, the substrates, um, yeah, it's kind of a, there's a few different ways I could take the question of substrates. It could be, um, there's kind of uh, some issues with the kind of what type of semiconductor uh, you're choosing as far as silicon, silicon germanium, you got nitride, um, and uh, the, the, so kind of the semiconductor substrate, do you know whether it's, it's kind of from a semiconductor perspective or more from like a substrate like an FR4 board or microstrip board being extended up. Um, 
do you, do you know Arian or no? Like um, Rosita is still in the lobby. So Rosita, if you have a response to that, um, yeah. feel free to. But um, but yeah. So I think um, people are starting to push um, circuit boards and technologies up into certainly the kind of uh, 50, 100 gigahertz, and 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 starting to push that higher um, using kind of new materials, some flexible things. There's actually people looking at as far as guiding waves around dielectric waveguides. People are looking at using that to say move information around in automobiles uh, through dielectric uh, waveguides and things like that. And, and so there's, there's a lot of activity in substrates, uh, both for microstripping and, and semiconductors. So. Great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for your response. Um, Jeremy, the next question is for you. Um, this is from Darren. Are the sensors for the frequencies um, very susceptible to temperature fluctuations or ambient radiation? And this is referring to terahertz sensors. Um, are they susceptible to, yeah, they, I mean, they, they can be. Um, I think actually it's probably a better question for Bobby on this. Um, so the yeah, short answer is yes, um, most of the uh, terahertz their performance properties depend on temperature. Uh, they're temperature sensitive. So um, you'll actually notice in a lot of the, um, this kind of ties back to the question on substrates to Jeffrey, that an another aspect of, of designing a lot of these components is the thermal aspect and how do you maintain them at a, at a temperature, operating temperature range where they actually have optimum performance. And so, and that's all because as you heat them up, they generally degrade in performance. You get worse noise, you, uh, um, you generate more carriers, which gives you more loss. And so, um, so temperature is a, is a factor, um, certainly. And I can't remember what the other part of the question was. So it's like ambient question? radiation, but I think, I think he was probably um, attaching to the, the hostile environment question. And it's not, to be clear, the sensors that we're talking about are not going to be used in the hostile environment. They're going to look into a hostile environment from outside through like a window or something like that so you know maybe the ambient radiation might might affect them but certainly temperature would because it is a physical device so i think that answered it's probably akin to uh, plasma diagnostics jeffrey was talking about that you have sensors external to what you're looking at but there is a, a way to transition to look into it but your sensor is actually not subject to the kind of the, the um you know, environment that would really be a problem if it was, so. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, and one final question from Greeny, uh, this is for Jeremy. Uh, what countries are using spectrums above 95 gigahertz? Um, I think other countries are using them for satellite and, you know, government applications, um, but I don't have the, I don't have the full list that's, it's a variety, it's kind of a mishmash of different things, but what we've been doing with Millimeter Wave Coalition has been really focusing on, on uh, the, US, the US area. Yes, and if you would like a list of countries that may also be available on the Millimeter Coalition's website or um, other related websites that are linked from there. And on that note, I'd like to thank the audience so much for your participation in our event today and the speakers, of course, for your in-depth discussion and time um, relating to terahertz technology. Um, a very quick recap, we've discussed today um, radio astronomy, cutting edge research at University of Virginia relating to terahertz. We've discussed the commercial um, availability through Virginia diodes of terahertz technology, and we've discussed uh, consumer perspective and government regulations surrounding terahertz technology with Jeremy. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I'll hand it off to Peter. Thank you very much, Ian, for the wonderful Peter, presentation. There? It was a great job, and thank you also for the panel uh, to, get this, to give this great information to everybody. We had a peak of 118 participate, which is great. Still 70 are available, didn't want to go to sleep, didn't want to go to work. Thank you so much. Just a short uh, look out what we will have coming up. The next event is the 5G overhyped event on July 23. I'm in the past, sorry about this. July 23 is our next upcoming event about 5G. 
you will learn what's happening there, what's good or bad or ugly. With this, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you on the West Coast, East Coast, everybody who joined us, Singapore, Japan, uh, China, all over the world. Thank you so much. We will see us again. Um, we apologize for the glitches what we have. We problem. We will solve the problem pretty soon, and we will promise that we will have other glitches at the next event. So, like I said, next event will be in July 23rd. Until then, thank you so much, and talk to you soon. Uh, with this, the show is over, and I close the meeting. Take care. Stay safe and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Arjen. Thank Thanks, Peter.